As you're seated, I want to invite you to find Deuteronomy chapter 31 and then Joshua chapter 1. Deuteronomy 31 and Joshua chapter 1. If you're watching online, we'll be putting these verses up on the screen. And thank you for joining us. We believe that you're not watching by accident. It's a divine appointment for everyone who's here today. We've been praying for you. We may have never met you, but we've been praying for you. We've been praying that this time together would be impactful in your life spiritually. And we want everyone to hear what they need to hear. We're all in different places, different places in our maturity and our commitment and our understanding of spiritual matters. But the Lord has something for each and every one of us. I believe that. Mm -hmm. And so let's just say open while we're here today. It's just a beautiful, beautiful presence of the Lord here. And so Deuteronomy chapter 31, Joshua chapter 1. And Lord, we thank you for your word, watching over it, making it good, and revealing truth to every heart that's here. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be talking about being strong and courageous this morning. Let's look at Deuteronomy 31 and verses 6 through 8. It says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you, and he will not leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses called Joshua, and he said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage. For you must go with his people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you, and he will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. There's a time of transition that's going on. Moses has been leading the people of God for 40 years. He's now 120 years of age. Upon his 120th birthday, he looked out on the people that he had been leading for 40 years, and he said, I'm no longer able to lead. I have taken you as far as I can take you. And the Lord has prepared me for this moment and has prepared those that will succeed me. And now the message that the Lord gave me at the beginning of my commission, I'm passing on to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. As God was with me, he's also going to be with you. And my days here on this earth are numbered. They're about to come to an end. The Lord has promised that I can look into the land that he is going to take you into, but my feet will never travel there. I will see it with my eyes, but I'll never experience it the way you will. You're going to have battles. It's going to be challenging. You're going to face new opposition that you've never encountered before. But don't be dismayed and don't be afraid. Now, that's somewhat easy for us to sit back on our sofas and sort of recline and take in because we weren't there. But that same message is pertinent to us today. There are new challenges for us. We're in a new season. There is opposition that we've never sensed or felt before. And it's not perceived. It's real. There is a war that's going on. There's a battle that is raging. And it's not a natural or a physical one, even though it might be portrayed in that manner by certain individuals or people. It's really for the hearts and the soul of a people. And not just us here in the United States. What's going on is global. There is actually something happening in the realm of the Spirit that is actually being lived out in the world in which we see. Everything that's happening in the natural first was preceded by something to, that took place spiritually. And so we're in that season right now where things are being revealed. Everything that was done in secret is now being announced on the housetops. Everything that was done in the dark is now being brought to the light. And a reminder, that's a wonderful way for us to pray as Christians. In order for us to have discernment in the days in which we live in, then we have to be able to see things the way they really are. And so all the agendas and all of the issues that are going on behind the scenes, just simply say, Lord, just bring it to the forefront. Bring it to the forefront. Help us to know what's going on so that we as your people would be able to make wise decisions in the day that we live in. So I encourage you to do that. But getting back here to this text, this is a very, very uh, what I would say, emotional 
transitional time for the nation of Israel. They had grown to depend and lean upon and trust Moses as their leader. And now, with him getting ready to move off the scene, you know how transition is. Have you ever been in a workplace and you have a new, you know, maybe you got a promotion and now you have a new supervisor and you were very comfortable with your former supervisor and now the person that you're working with directly may or may not be your cup of tea. I don't know if you've ever had that kind of experience. You remember going from the sixth grade, for me it was the sixth grade, I went into junior high. So I left a very comfortable setting in school where I was king in my class. I mean, we were sixth graders. We ruled the halls. We bossed those fifth graders around like the best, right? And then all of a sudden you move up to seventh grade. For me, that would have been junior high. And all of a sudden the ninth graders are like, oh man, picking on me relentlessly. And there was an initiation in that transition brought about a sense of uncertainty. I remember sort of sharing with my mom, I don't know that I really want to go to school this year. She says, hey, hey, you don't have an option. There are such things as truancy officers. And for those of you online, you may not know what that is, but that's like designated police that go around and pick up kids that are riding around during school time on their bicycles. That was me. All right. So uh, there was this sense of concern and anxiety because of it being new. And new things have a way of sort of upending our apple cart. So it is with this situation. You know, we all enjoy our routines. And we're all comfortable with what we're comfortable with. And when our comfort creature, uh, creatures are removed, oh, we begin to feel this pressure, this anxiety, and sometimes even fear. So this morning, let's turn over to Joshua chapter 1, and let's see as this continues to unfold, this story and this transition, uh, what the Lord now does to help Joshua during this time. In verse 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. I've always thought that this initial instruction by the Lord to Joshua was um, interesting. So he identifies Joshua as Moses' assistant. You have always been in the second chair. You're getting ready to move to the first chair. But he says something that throughout the reading and throughout my reading of Scripture, I always thought was like, why did he say that? Wasn't it just apparent? He reminded him that Moses was dead. Now, follow me for a minute. Imagine after Moses passed away, because no one was there when Moses passed away. You remember the story? He climbed the mountain of God. He looked over into the promised land. He passed away, and the Lord buried Moses. So no one else was present. So they potentially, Joshua included, woke up every day and looked at that mountain thinking Moses is going to come on the other side of that mountain and come back. And the Lord says to Joshua, he's not coming back. He's with me. He is not coming back. How many of us long for days that would come back? People that would come back. Situations that would come back. And we wake up and we look out on the horizon of life, whatever it might be look like, and we look for that which is familiar and common and something that is predictable. Those days have changed. Certain days aren't coming back. Now, over time, we might begin to comprehend and accept that. Right now, I think, for the most part, we're a nation in shock and mourning. And many people are in denial and even grieving. And they haven't identified emotionally or relationally what's going on with them. They just know they don't like it. Anybody not like it? Okay, And so during this time, in the times that we live in, and just 
let me remind you, we live in the last days, not the tribulation days. So some people are intertwining those two. They don't need to be intertwined. We're not in, entered into the tribulation yet. We're in the last days. These days were foretold. The signs of the times were shared unto us so that we would be prepared. Not that we would be paranoid, but so that we would be prepared. But there still is this, really, that's going to happen? It's like Moses saying to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Well, Joshua could have thought, yeah, I need to do that because the responsibilities that I have in supporting Moses are pretty challenging. He could have just interpreted that in a completely different way and not even heard or even comprehended what was about to take place. So now, since Moses started the conversation, the Lord is going to bring it back to Joshua's remembrance. The message is the same message. Many times, it's not hearing something different, it's hearing something again. You remember in the Gospels that when John was in prison, he began to question, did I identify the Messiah correctly? When I said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, did I get the right person? And he was in prison. Not for doing something wrong, but for doing something that was honorable and righteous before God. So there he was suffering in prison, and Jesus told John's disciples, go tell John again. He needed to hear him. That, yes, the blind are receiving their sight, the lame are walking, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You got it right. You got it right. And we just need that assurance. And we need that reminder in times like this. And having something brought to our remembrance is so crucial and so vital and so important for our stability and for us to be steadfast. I'm going to make a statement that may cause your head to go tilt a little bit because it's such a simplistic statement but the depth of it will protect you from deception. Here it is. In different seasons or transitions or uncertain times, don't start looking for something new. Hold on to, to what is true. It's not what's new that sets you free. It's what's true that sets you free. And so many people are looking and trying to discover something that's new. And listen. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word doesn't change. His ways do not change. And yet, we want God to do something he's never done before. And that is an indicator that we want God to work on our terms. And we don't want to simply surrender to his ways. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So we have to keep in mind that we have to be able to hear the truth over and over again. Verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I will give to you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness of this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to the fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous that you may observe to do according to all that the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So when we're reminded of truths that we have heard or scriptures are brought to our remembrance by the Holy Spirit, 
it's not because we don't know. It's because we need to be awakened to that truth at that moment. We have selective hearing. And we also have selective memories. So when something is brought to our remembrance, it's what we need to hear at that time. It's a now word. It's a rhema word. Anxiety and fear, troubling times, worry, change, pressure, promotion can cause us to forget. Promotion has an interesting emotional attachment to it because we want promotion, but sometimes we don't want the responsibility that comes with it. And it's easier to be in the second seat and forecast what you would do in the first seat until you're in the first seat. Anybody ever been there? Have you helped your boss be a better boss at times? Have you helped your parents be better parents? Have you ever helped your coach know what to do? Coach, I'll tell you what we need to do. <laughs> yeah, you need to sit down over there right now and let me decide what we're going to do. It happens all the time. I, I don't find that to be offensive or I don't find that to be unusual. I just think it's sometimes... Our desire and our passion is just on display at that moment. So we've all been in relationships, haven't we, that have helped to strengthen and encourage us by way of reminder? Let me use this on a positive note now. How about a parent-child relationship? Every child has been the bene benefactor of good parenting. A teacher and a student. All students have been you know, better educated because the teacher was willing to bring things to their remembrance. You remember those foundational days when you were learning the basics of arithmetic? Every engineer in here knows if you didn't get your pluses and minuses, your multiplication and division correct, then you couldn't move on to greater disciplines in math. And because of that, you couldn't design or create things that would help this world be a better place. But how many times did you go 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 2 is 2, 0 plus 3 is 3? Remember the flashcards? And what happened? Over time and over things being brought to your remembrance, understanding came. You pretty, soon, you pretty soon you understood why 0 plus 2 was 2. At first, you just memorized it. Anybody just memorized something before? There's a big difference between memorizing something and learning something. Learning or faith comes by hearing and hearing. So God never gets tired of reminding us because we forget. What causes us to forget? Well, sometimes promotion. All of a sudden, we're in that new position, and we have to make the decision. We have to lead. We have to chart the course. We have to make, sometimes even, the challenging decisions. And that, at that time, hopefully we can draw upon our experience, and draw upon the counsel that we've gained in times past, and make a wise one. Here's a good one, a coach and a team. I've mentioned that before. That's been a good place where we've been reminded of things. And an employer, an employee. And as it's been with all of those relationships, so it is with God's Spirit helping bring God's Word to His people's remembrance. This happens in a certain environment. It just doesn't happen accidentally. It happens because we position ourselves to hear. First of all, in our heart, that we desire to hear. We're not trying to figure it out, but we actually are seeking the counsel of the Lord. So the greatest enemy of us listening and hearing truth again and again is the enemy of all of our progress. It's pride. Has someone ever tried to tell you something again and their intention and you felt like their motive was right but you just didn't want to hear it at the moment 
and you gave them that look, you know, that look that speaks volumes. You didn't say a word, but you just gave them that look like, dude, I already know. That's it. That's it. I, I got it. I got the memo three months ago. But potentially they're doing that to protect you from pride and to keep you within a safe place so that you never forget. They're not saying you don't know. What they're saying is, I just want you to remember this. They're not saying that you don't have the capacity to do it. What they're saying is, this is safe for you. And so let's not get a, I know that attitude. Yeah, I've heard that. Come on, tell me something I don't know. Remember, when you start looking for something that's new, the devil can accommodate because he can work in the realm of the intellect as well as the realm of the senses. And in the days that we're living in, there's going to be plenty of false signs and wonders. You know the difference between real signs and wonders and false signs and wonders? True signs and wonders point people to Jesus. False signs and wonders point people to people. One creates a discipleship mode that depends and gives God glory. The other creates an unhealthy codependency that I need you in order to hear from God. I need you in order to know what God is saying because that is a very dangerous relationship to be in because as Christians, God gave you His Spirit that bears witness with your spirit so that you can be led by Him. While you might receive confirming words... When you start looking for something that's new, you can get off course in a hurry. The, the enemy is a master at accommodating that kind of inquisitive nature where we're just not satisfied with hearing the truth again. Anybody with me? Am I a little too close to the... You're holding your cards a little close to the chest this morning, right? You know, I'm not going to show him that he's talking. Oh, no, no, I'm not going to show him he's talking about me. I'm talking to all of us. I'm in on this. Peter, who was perhaps the most challenging of Jesus' disciple to give instruction to, is the one that the Holy Spirit used to share this important truth about the importance of reminders. If you read Peter's letters, he's the one that said, being reminded of things is needful, useful, and a sign of love. Everybody say that. Needful. Useful, useful, a sign of love. Sign of love. Yeah. It's because people want you to get it. People want you to be safe. People want you to make it all the way to the end and not become disqualified. So the message that Moses gave to Joshua to be strong and courageous, and then the Lord reminding Joshua to be strong and courageous is a timeless truth that Paul in his letters to the church continue to share and here we are again hearing this truth. Let's go now to the book of Ephesians and read that portion of Scripture that we have heard many times, but let's hear it again. Let's hear it again. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to pick up in the 10th verse. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. So he is concluding his letter. He didn't start off with this reminder, but he ended with this reminder. In light of everything that he has said, and he, the book of Ephesians is a power-packed book about your redemptive place in Christ and God's predestined plan for you and His seeding of you and his vesting you with authority and his placement of you and the gifts that he gave unto the church to help equip you for the work that he's called you unto and all of these beautiful relationships that parallel Christ and the church, a husband and a wife, and then how children should interact with their parents and how you should work as unto the Lord and not unto men. And he just, I mean, it is just loaded with what I call practical Christian living as well as spiritual realities of redemption, of your placement and God's positioning and his power and all of those wonderful things. It has those things that he's done for us eternally and ways that we express them and live them out relationally. It's all found there in the book of Ephesians. And then at the conclusion of that instruction, he says, hey, there's one other thing that I need to help you with. 
And I'm sure that they were aware of what he was about to say, but he was going to use it in an illustrative way so that they would really be able to get it. And he says this, verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the tricks or the schemes. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So he's saying that your battle, for the most part, is not a natural or a physical one, but a spiritual one. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day or the day of temptation, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We need to be prepared, prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have within us. Our preparation should be so that we would be vessels that could share the gospel well as we have opportunity. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked ones. So your faith is so important in order for you to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You need to know more about your faith than you do about your foe. Let me say that again. You need to know more about your faith than you do your foe. If all you are is an expert on the devil and you're not an expert on Jesus, you'll never defeat the devil. You have to know who your source is, where your power comes from, and where your victory is. While we're not ignorant of the devil's devices, we're much more aware of our position and our placement and the weapons that God has given unto us, because that's how you're going to win in this spiritual battle. Praying with all prayer. No, verse 17. Take up the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So the last piece of the armor, and one of the pieces that many times we don't talk about that much, is our prayer life. Praying with all prayer, all manner of prayer, all kinds of prayer. Paul said you can pray in your understanding, you can also pray in the Spirit. Why would we pray in the Spirit, or why would God fill us with His Spirit, and we would begin to speak in a new tongue? It's because there's things that we don't know how to pray for in our understanding. There's times that we don't understand what's going on, but you know who has the mind of Christ and will reveal it unto us and will pray through us and give us utterance? The Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is God. He's not God's sidekick. It's not like Batman, Robin, and yeah, the Holy Spirit. You know, God the Father is Batman and Jesus is Robin and then the Holy Spirit is like the little kid that comes around like the third wheel Come on, Jimmy, let's go play. No, 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 yeah. and No, he is part of the blessed trinity. So he knows everything about the Father and about the Son, and he's here to reveal that to us. We don't know everything about the Father and Son. There's times that when we're praying, the best way to pray if you have a burden and you're not quite sure which way to go with it, and you've prayed all you know how to pray, all the scriptures you know how to pray, and you've stood, begin to pray in the Spirit. Begin to pray in other tongues. Begin to pray and lift up your voice to God. And the Holy Spirit comes and helps us at that moment. It's one of the ways that you stay full of the Spirit also. I mean, that's a very true quality that is given unto us in light of the New Testament. And we're going to be talking about that next week in more of its significance and importance in the day that we live in. But being mindful of this, this is part of how you're clothed with Christ. If I was to give you a simple reminder of what Paul is saying to the church at this point, he's saying, be strong and courageous. And this is how you do it. Put on Christ. You may not be able to be strong in yourself, and I'm not asking you to do that. And you may not be able to be courageous, and I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm asking you to do is put on Christ. Put on His truth. Accept His righteousness. Be prepared to share His peaceful message. 
Let your mind be clothed with salvation. Take up the shield of faith. Use the sword of the Spirit. And and all things that you do, interweave and cover everything in prayer. Now, what happens when you begin to put on Christ? You become confident. Not arrogant, not rude, not unmannerly, because that's not Christ. You gain confidence. Confidence. Confidence to go forward. Confidence to follow. Confidence to know that, hey, just as the Lord was with Moses, just as the Lord was with Joshua, the Lord is with us. The message that God gave to Moses is the message that he gives to all men of all generations. I'm never going to abandon you. I'm always going to be with you. Jesus' assurance to his disciples was, it's better that I go away. In my absence, the Holy Spirit comes and he will live within you and he will always be with you. What Jesus was to the disciples, the Holy Spirit is to the church. An ever-present companion and help who teaches us, leads and guides us, brings things to our remembrance, comforts us, empowers us, teaches us. And through his gifts, the wonderful manifestations of the Holy Spirit, then Jesus and the Father are glorified. Wherever the manifestation of the gifts are in operation, and we should earnestly desire that, you know the result of the manifestation of the gifts is that the lost come to Christ and the believer says, God has been in our midst. So whether it's the vocal gifts, whether it's the power gifts, whether it's the inspirational gifts, all of them are necessary in the day that we live in. Why? Because it's how we're strong and courageous. It's how we're able to do great exploits. It's how we're able to serve God acceptably. In and of ourselves, we are frail and fragile. But in Christ and clothed in Christ, we are well able to stand. We are well able to do what he's asked us to do. I'm about to conclude, but let me remind you of this truth. We live in the last days, not tribulation days. Yes, there's trials and tribulation, but do not put your head down Scripture says, when you see these things happening, lift up your eyes. Your redemption draws nigh. We're closer now than we've ever been before, which reminds me of this. God has something for you to do. God has somewhere for you to go, and what's it going to take to do it and to go? Strength and courage. You may have never gone, and you may have never done but God's asking you to. The Great Commission is to you. It's to go. And as you go, he said, do these things. Now, that might unnerve some of you. And in the flesh, I can understand that. If you've never done it before, if you never shared your faith, you may not know where to start. Let me tell you, everyone loves a story. Just tell yours. Your story about you and Jesus is the greatest story It is a wonderful story. It's a real story. And God will use your story. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Very simple, isn't it? Secondly, if you've never done before and you have a litany of excuses, let me remind you of a truth that a coach told me one time as I was whining during two-a-day practices in football. He stood me up on my feet with a little bit of help, which they wouldn't do today. But he got my attention, stood me up, looked me in the eye, and he called me by my name. Not my proper name, my last name. You always know that the coach is trying to get your attention when he calls your last name. And he said something like this. No, he said something exactly like this. Brady! Yes. Excuses are like armpits. Everyone has two and they stink. Now get over there and do that drill. Yes, sir. I think we were doing monkey rolls. What's a monkey roll have to do with football? Well, I found out later, you get knocked down a lot in football, and if you learn to do the monkey roll, you get up pretty quick. 
<laughs> Sometimes in our life, the way that God brings things to our remembrance is by calling us by name and saying, you can do it. I'm with you. I think he's more compassionate than a coach, more patient than a coach, more wise than a coach. But you get the idea. So when he brings something to your remembrance, it's because he believes that you can do it and that you're ready to go. What you need to understand is, my responsibility is to be clothed with Christ. Not to try to figure it out and not to tell the coach or the Lord how to do it or the best way to do it, but just to do it. Amen? So, I want to, clu- I want to close with this. And you can be, uh, if you would, you can stand with me. Courage, courage is not the absence of fear, it's the assurance that God is faithful. It is a quality of mind and spirit that enables us to meet opposition or the challenges of life with confidence in God and His Word. One of the keys to clothing yourself in Christ and to being clothed and staying clothed is to meditate. Meditate in the Word of God. That's what Scripture says. It calms and quiets our concerns when you meditate. It calms and quiets our concerns. It sharpens our vision. It gives us clarity. All the confusion and gray matter leaves as you spend time meditating in the Word. And then it reassures us of the faithfulness of God. There's no God as big as our God. There's no God as great as our God. Everything that's going on in the world right now, I believe that God is using so that men, again, would take a season to assess their life in light of his salvation. God is calling the world back unto himself. We have done our own thing and gone our own way long enough. We have filled our calendars with our agendas and our lives with our desires and our wants, and we have asked God to bless it, and he has been merciful. But I also believe that, unfortunately, we have gotten our focus off of him and we've got it on to too much of what we want to do. Let's get back, putting him in his proper place, allowing him to lead and guide us, us being clothed with himself, and us going and doing what he's asked us to do. I'm not against, and you guys understand this, I'm not against recreational activity. But it's not what we live for. It's not our number one passion or desire. I think going on vacations, taking time apart, is a biblical principle. I think rest is something that we need to learn how to do as people. But I think first and foremost, we always need to keep him in his rightful place. So I'm going to continue to bring that to your remembrance because there's this yearning to get back to something that for some people, will never return in the manner in which it was at one time. But there's something that's in our future and that is before us that if we will embrace it and hold on to it, will be fulfilling and satisfying because it will be what the Father wants us to be doing. So if you don't know what's going on, just say, God, continue to lead and guide me. And thank you for that. Thank you for watching today's message. If you'd like to know more about today's message or the ministry here at Living Word Fellowship in Knoxville, Iowa, please call 641-828-7119 or visit us online at lwfknoxville.com. If you are in the Knoxville, Iowa area, please stop by and see us on Sundays at 10 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at 321 East Robinson, where there's always something for everyone.